want to thank everyone for the blessings as I came here this morning. I was greeted at the door and I was very, very impressed with our Sabbath school because it's the very thing that we are doing in our church is focusing on many different things. The study, evangelism, and I heard a personal ministry person also shared about doing Bible study. Dear friends, it's not from the Canadian conference. It is not from the North American division. It is God, God's desire for each and every one of us to share the gospel and make disciples. So I, I am very, very thrilled to see this. And it is a blessing to be here. Thank you, Pastor Morris, Pastor North, for extending the invitation. I bring the greetings from Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. In that region, we have a lot of tornadoes. Um, I was just reassigned to a different district. The district I was previously, you probably heard about it in the news a couple years ago, um, it is Moore, Oklahoma, where they had that devastating tornado. It was a mile from my church, one of my churches there in that city. And so um, I live in a place where there's a lot of um, destructive um, as far as climatic changes and we have powerful storms but it all reminds us of the soon coming of Jesus and it's reminding us and I could also think about uh, last year my mother visited and um, as she visited it so happened um, a couple years ago um, and also last year when she visited there was the tornado sirens going off and you watch it on the news and you hear the, the news person, the meteorologist say, you know, they have it play by play. You've never seen weather reporters until you go to a place like that. They have people in the car showing you real live videos, helicopters showing you where the tornado is. And they would say something like, uh, if you're there in Downsview, the, the tornado is heading north. If you know anyone in that area, call them, text them. Twitter them, Facebook them, tell them they need to get covered. And I only think about that as we think of the coming of Jesus. We know what is coming. Yeah. Uh, and so we should be getting our families ready, our church ready, our block ready, our neighbors ready, our co-workers ready. Because this is the biggest storm that will come upon this earth. But God's people, it says a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. So, God, dear, dear friends, God has a special work for us to do. And I believe it is now that we do it. I think this mic is giving me the feedback or something. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm getting a little bit of feedback coming through. This morning, I want us to be very prayerful. We're in a battle, as our Sabbath school talked about. It is the greatest conflict for your life and my life. And so I simply say this. I know there are different people and maybe you're distracted. Just this week I was teaching at the academy, teach the high school twice a week, and this week I was mentioning, I, I noticed there was a young lady in the back, she was doing her own thing while I was talking. But it was such urgency in talking about the coming of Jesus. And so I stopped the class and I said, if you were on an airplane and the pilot came on the intercom and said to all the passengers, 350, you were included. And they say, we have a critical emergency on this aircraft. Our closest airport is 200 miles away. We cannot make it there. It is destruction that is coming. And I asked the students, would you continue reading the magazine in your pocket in front of you? <laughs> would you continue the little trivial conversation with the person next to you? Would you continue to say, well, let me take a, a rest before because you are going to die. 
And so I simply say this today, when we have the opportunity to hear the word of God, it is not me speaking, it is the word of God Amen. speaking to us. Amen. And nothing should hinder that conversation with God with us. So if you have someone next to you and they're disturbing you, tell them, this is an emergency. It is a critical emergency on board. And we cannot continue business as usual. I cannot continue talking with the person next to me. Because the end is near and Jesus is going to come. And how shall you stand? That should be the only question on our mind. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, I am so grateful, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. I praise you for your faithfulness. Even when we're unfaithful, Lord, you remain faithful. Lord, this morning I pray that you would speak to our hearts. We are living in a time such as never before. We're seeing many, many challenges, but Lord, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? And so, Lord, today I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Empower us with your spirit to live godly lives. Forgive us, Lord, for the sins we have committed against you, the trespasses against one another. And I pray the power of the living God will be present to expound and open our understanding and give us wisdom and obedience to follow your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There's a gentleman, you probably have heard his name, Ganu Diop. He's one of the leaders in our Religious Liberty Department, Public Affairs, Missions. And he said these words. He says, in spite of an unprecedented global mobilization to promote religious freedom, the state of religious freedom in the world remains bleak. He notes that recent data collected by the Adventist Church, as well as other watchdog agencies, all point to a global religious freedom landscape that is growing more restrictive and less stable. Even more sobering is the rapidly growing threat posed in many religions, many regions rather, by so-called non-state actors, such as terror organizations and militia groups. You probably heard these on the news, ISIS and other groups. All of this is pointing to some climatic point that is coming in the near future. My message today wants to convey one point, and it is this. God is our refuge and strength, Amen. and a very present help in trouble. Amen. Therefore, we will not fear. Amen. Though the earth be removed and the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea, God is our refuge Amen. and strength. Amen. And so if you have anything that you, you want to take home, it is that. And so turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. And the story in Genesis chapter 32 talks about a gentleman you probably remember, never heard of it maybe, and his name is Jacob. This man, Jacob, he, was, he shared the same space, the, share, the same womb as his brother Esau. But he used deceit, deception, he lied, and he took his brother's inheritance. He took his brother's birthright, and he had to flee. And it tells us a very important point that when we use deception and lies, we're always on the run. And this man had to run 20 years he was away, and now God had given him an instruction to return, and so he was being faithful to God, and he returned. And now we pick up the story in verse 22, verse 22, where he is now going to meet his brother. The Bible says, and he arose, speaking of Jacob, that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, 
and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of dawn, or breaking of the day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. Verse 30. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Amen. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun arose on him, and he lived on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Yeah. Today, I want to look at four Ps, four Ps in the life of Jacob. And my sermon title is entitled, The Time of Jacob's Trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. I want to draw your attention first, just looking at a few things that we just looked at. In verse 24, it talks about Jacob. And what who, did Jacob have a rest, all of his church members with him in this wrestling match? No. Did he have his their love, loving wives, his two wives, did he have them with him? No. No. He says he was what? Left alone. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, this man he was wrestling, anyone know who this man was? Angel. The angel of the covenant. Who is the angel of the covenant? It is Jesus Christ himself. If you read in the spirit of prophecy, it clearly tells us, and there are many passages in scripture telling us this very clearly. And so this man wrestled with Jesus until the breaking of the day. The first point I want to make is prayer. This man was praying. Praying. Did you know this year, the North American Division, the focus, the theme for this year for, for the North American Division, does anyone know what the prayer focus is? It's called Hope, H-O-P-E, dash heals, Hope Heals. Hope stands for houses of prayer everywhere and it brings healing. Hope heals, houses of prayer. And so Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. prayer. And so God's people preparing for the time of great trouble will be prayerful people. God's people who are seeking for the end to come will be prayerful people. How do we know this? If you read in the book of Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives a parable about the widow and he talks about those and he's making a point about those living in the last days. Shall not God avenge his own elect who cry unto him out alone? Day and night though he bears long with him. So God's people who are waiting for the coming of Jesus will be prayerful people. Amen. God's people who are waiting for the coming of Jesus will have prayerful families. Amen. Dear friends, we live in, and I know you have the same issues in, in this part of the vineyard as we do in, in the United States. Busyness. Are you all busy here? Yes. Work, work, work. Busy. Someone said to me, busy means being under Satan's yoke. <laughs> busy. Did you realize before the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt, they were busy. Pharaoh made them busy. You have to go and make all of this brick, but we're not giving you straw, so you have to work longer hours. Satan wants us to be busy. Busy so we will not fulfill what our personal ministry leader was saying in giving Bible study. Busy so that we cannot come to prayer meeting and pray. I wonder how many of you come to prayer meeting. Is it Wednesday, Pastor? On Wednesday. God's 
church will be praying. God's church will be pleading for people to be delivered from the bondage of sin. And so prayer is very, very important. It's been a few weeks now and the Holy Spirit's been impressing me. And God uses many different things in, in real life. And so, you know, you like soccer, maybe football or different things. But in America, NFL, the National Football League, is very popular. And so I, I was wondering to myself, I wonder what their preparation is on game day. They play on Sundays generally. And so I went online and I Googled and I looked up the NFL's routine for game day. You're talking about orderly. You think God's church is orderly. You read the NFL's uh, routine for game day. At this time, the players must enter. At this time, they can go to the locker room. At this time, they can stretch. At this time, they can have a warm-up. At this time, he gives every detail. They go to the preparation before you see a game on TV. They've already been preparing. Hours. And so the Holy Spirit was impressing me, saying, Michael, what are you doing on game day? What are you doing on Sabbath? What are you doing? Uh, brethren, are you running in? Because you see those players, they have to warm up. They have to stretch. They go over the plays. They go back into the locker room. They come back out of the locker room. What about Sabbath school? Our members meeting together to pray for game day. And so the Lord impressed me. He woke me up that one morning as he brought that to my mind. 2.15. It's game day. What are you doing? There are souls who would be coming in the church who need to hear the word of God. It's game day. Amen. And I went to the church that morning early and walked through the pews, praying for the people who will come into the Sabbath school room. And the thought came to my mind, what would happen if we really, really pray like Jacob? If we really wrestle with God and wrestle with him and says, I will not let you go until what? What would happen, dear friends, if mothers and fathers, maybe you're going through a struggle right now in your marriage, and you say, Lord, we're not good. you're not holding on to each other, you're holding on to God, who will hold on to you, go, both of you, and you're saying, I will not let you go. The husband is saying, I will not let you go, Lord, until you bless my wife and I and our marriage, our children, who are turned away from you. God is calling us to wrestle like this man Jacob did. But Jesus is the best wrestler. Didn't you know that? And I want you to go with me in your minds to the Bible in the book of Luke chapter 22. Because in Luke chapter 22, you could look there, but in Luke chapter 22, it tells us of Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane, the oil press. And there he was wrestling with the Father. You thought Jacob was a wrestler. It is Jesus is the master wrestler. And Jesus was there as our example, and he was in the garden wrestling with his father. I want you to see Jesus on the cold ground. I want you to see his body outstretched, prostrate, almost as if your sin and my sin, the guilt and, and all the guilt of humanity is crushing his very life. I want you to see the blood-stained brow of our Savior. And you know that is a medical um, diagnosis called hematodroisis, where it's under extreme circumstances. They've recorded this in medical journals, where someone is about to go to the guillotine, have their neck cut off, and they've recorded it, where they actually have sweat with blood. Yeah. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to hear his cry to his Father. If there be any other way he's crying out. Let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your will be done. I want you to hear those very words, but it is not Jesus' sin that he's crying out and saying, let this cup. It is your sin that is in his cup. It is my guilt that is in his cup. It is my unbelief that is in his cup. It is my rebellion that is in his cup. It's my adultery that is in his cup. It is my whatever that's in his cup. Yes. And Jesus is drinking that and he is putting it to his lips and he knows it will cause separation. Yes. Can you imagine Jesus and the Father is just in utter, utter sadness to see the one who was in the bosom for eternity suffering on our behalf. 
And he wrestled. And he wrestled. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, he was letting them know about this time that was coming. Over and over, he would let them know that he, would, the Son of Man, will suffer these things. He would tell them over and over, but they didn't want to hear them. And so Jesus got up from wrestling with his father, and he goes back, and it says it was only a throw, a stone's throw, so he's very close, and he walked over, staggered over there. I see Jesus staggering under the weight of sin. Yes. And he looks over, and I see him looking at these disciples. There's Peter, there's James, there's John, and they are fast asleep. Yes. Can you not watch with me, he says. Can you not watch one hour and pray with me? Jesus wanted his tempted soul to be lifted up above. How many of you daily pray for the pastor? How many of you daily pray for the elders? How many of you daily pray for the Sabbath school department leaders? How many of you daily pray for those who will present the music on Sabbath? That is what God is calling us to do, to wrestle all week. We can pray without ceasing. You don't have to be on your knees. You can be on the job, and you're pleading with God. You're driving on the bus, and you are in prayer. You're walking in the grocery store, and you're praying. You look over there, and you see my sister is in great trial, maybe the cash register or whatever, and you're praying on her behalf. Angels are moving on our behalf when we pray. Father in heaven, we pray for the Spirit of God to anoint us, Amen. to empower us, to open our eyes. We know the Bible tells us, Paul says, Satan has blinded our eyes, our minds that we might not see. Behold the wonderful gospel of Jesus. We pray today that you would remove, rip those veils from our eyes, anoint our eyes with eyes out that we might see. Amen. And we thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name. Jesus was a man of prayer. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 1 verse 35, rising a great while before day, Jesus went out into the solitary place and there prayed. Yes. My brother was mentioning, I was born into the church, I'm talking my rebirth, because of prayer. Yeah. If it were not for the prayers of my mother, father, loved ones, I would not be here today. So I believe in this. Yes. I believe. If, 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 you, if you heard the story, let's say your mother says, son, you were born because the doctor used this experimental medicine and you would have died, but this medicine was what was used and here you are today. I would be an advocate for that medicine. Yes. Yes. And so I was born because of prayer, the power of prayer into this world as far as my rebirth into Christ. And that is why I believe in prayer. Daniel was a man of prayer as he was being prepared for the greatest trouble. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. We're looking at our first point which is prayer. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. And Daniel was a man that was always faithful to God. In Daniel chapter 6 but before we read in verse 10 I want you to see about Daniel's life. In Daniel, cha Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel distinguished, or it says, to excel himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Is there an excellent spirit in you? Can your co-worker say, you know, I don't believe the way they believe, but there's an excellent spirit in my sister. Can your, far, can, can your uh, neighbors, rather, say the same thing for you? Daniel, the Bible says in verse 4, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find how many charge? No charge or fault. Because he was what? Faithful. Nor was there any fault or error of fault found in him. The only reason there was no error of fault because he had the righteousness of God, not his own. But there was a decree that was given. And dear friends, a decree will be given on this planet. Yes. Everything you read in the book of Daniel will take place in the end times. Oh, yes. Daniel is a book that we should understand. And you see, God is faithful. 
God is faithful. Amen. In Daniel chapter 6, when the decree was given, this is what Daniel did. In verse, chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and cried. Is that what he did? No. He went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks. Yes. You have a death decree and you're giving thanks. Why? Because God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Amen. I guarantee God, um, Daniel, this man Daniel knew Psalm 46. Yes. I guarantee he knew Psalm 91. Yes. And so here he prayed, but we can't miss the last part. It says he gave thanks before his God as his custom since early days. Amen. Dear friends, the point I want to make on this, this first point about prayer is that when the time of trouble, when this breaks forth upon us, and I read just today, it says it will come as a thief in the night. Amen. You will awaken one morning and it is different all around us. And if you have never tested and tried God and say, I know who I, I believe in, for I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed against unto him against that day. If you have not trusted in God, you will not be praying to that God. You will be trusting in your own doings in that hour. This man, Daniel, He did this since his early days. Jacob wrestled. And I want to read you something from the great controversy. It says, Jacob's night of anguish when he wrestled in prayer for deliverance from the hand of Esau represents the experience of God's people in the time of trouble. Jacob's only hope was in the mercy of God. His only defense must be in prayer. Yeah. Yet, the, yet he leaves nothing undone on his own part to atone for the wrong to his brother and to avert the threatened danger. So should the followers of Christ, as they approach the time of trouble, make every exertion to place themselves in a proper light before the people, to disarm prejudice, and to avert the danger which threatens liberty of conscience. In this time, we should be wrestling with God because part of what Jacob was doing was wrestling to see if he had any sins. Am I forgiven, O oh God? We should be wrestling and asking God to remove anything from us that separates us from Him. First point is prayer. The second point is we go back to Genesis chapter 32. It is the promises of God. The first key is prayer. The second is the promises of God. Here, Jacob was holding on to the promises of God in verse 9. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 9. It says, Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and your family, and I will deal with you. So God had promised that. But I want you to look at verse 12. It says, here was another promise he was bringing before the Lord. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Dear friends, the promises of God. Have you spent time reading the promises of God? Claiming those promises. Amen. As our dear sister Jean was in prayer, did you realize she was quoting promises after promises after Amen. promises Amen. in her prayer? There's no more powerful prayer than the quote what God has said. Lord, you have said this. And God is faithful. Here's what the Bible tells us in Joshua 21, 45. Not a single one of all the good promises of the Lord had given to the family of Israel was left unfulfilled. Everything he had spoken came true. So today, dear friends, there are promises of God you can claim. Maybe you have children that are not in the church. There are promises in the Bible. Yes. God says he will contend with him that contend with thee and he will save our children. Yes. That is a promise of God. God is faithful. You may not see it today, but remain faithful in praying the word of God and claiming the promises of God. The promises of God says that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And he will do this in 
in the last days. Amen. The promises of God are true. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what he says he will do? Amen. He will come again. So he is faithful. Amen. His word is true. Yes. And so claim the promises of God. The third P, we've looked at prayer, we've looked at the promises of God. The third P I want us to look at is persistence. Let's look at some persistence here. In verse 24, it says, Then Jacob left alone, was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. But I want us to zero in on where it really showed some persistence. And the persistence we see is in verse 28. And he said, this is God speaking, Jesus speaking right now to him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. And does anyone know what his name meant before? Deceiver, supplanter. He says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which means literally God prevailed. But Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have what? Prevailed. Prevail. Persistence. Persistence. You know, in the parable in the book of Luke chapter 11, remember where Jesus was talking about a man who came at midnight to ask for three loaves of bread for his friend. And the friend was saying, I am already in bed. But remember what Jesus said. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his what? Persistence. Yes. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. Are you troubling God? Are you knocking on his heart's door? Are you pleading for your own life? Dear friends, think about it. The end of all things is at hand. And when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, there will only be two groups. Yes. Not two religions. Two groups. Two groups of people who will be on this earth. Now you probably say, well, we have this religion. It is all going to polarize to two groups. My sheep hear my voice and, and he knows them. And they follow him. Jesus, the Lamb, wherever he leads. Then there's another group who will be maybe Christian. And Jesus will say to that group, because they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do many wonderful miracles in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And what does Jesus say? I knew you not. Depart from me, you workers, who you will practice lawlessness. And so there will be those two groups. My question, a sobering question is, which group are you in today? You never ask that question about tomorrow. Because the Bible says, now is the accepted time. Today, if you hear my voice, what? Harden not your hearts. And so it is an urgent message, and Satan is, is fighting for our souls. I want you to go with me in your minds to the foot of the cross on that Friday. And there at the foot of the cross, I want you to press in to our Savior. I want you to see our Lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ. And I want you to picture Him looking into your eyes. Looking at you intently. Even though He does not say a word, His very look has a book written in it. He is looking at you and you see this look of love and desire for you to be saved. You see this look that is saying, why go down the wrong path? Why continue down the wrong road? Why continue in this sinful life that is causing pain and destruction to you and all those around you? Why do you not accept my love? Paul says God demonstrated and Jesus on the cross, he demonstrated his love towards us. Amen. Greater love hath no man than this, yes. that a man lay down his life for his friend. Amen. 
I don't know about you, dear friends. Thank you, God. But I desire for this God who prevailed over all powers of darkness. That is why he says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but not my words. Amen. Amen. All heaven and earth, everything, all power in heaven and earth was given to Jesus. Yes. He prevailed. Yes. He prevailed. Yes. He was a man of prayer. The promises of God were always in his life. Amen. You see him prevail. He was persistent, persistent, persistent yes. over and over and over in his seeking for you and I to be saved. Amen. There's a quote I want to read to you from a great controversy. As you think about our condition, our talk today is about the time of Jacob's trouble. It's about religious liberty, freedom. This comes from the chapter, The Persecution of the First Century. There is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches of today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. How many? All. Oh. Oh. So if you and I are being persecuted at, at home, maybe there's a wife who is married to an unbeliever or, or a husband married to an unbelieving wife. Maybe you're being persecuted at work. You and I should not think it's strange no. concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Oh. Peter says rejoice in as much as your partakers of Christ suffer. Yes. And so here, this is talking about all, Paul says, that will live godly. Live godly. In Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Here is the question that is posed in great controversy. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber or sleep? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standards and therefore awakens no opposition. I'll read that again. The only reason is that the church is conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church, that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church, and the spirit of persecution will be revived. And the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Amen. So dear friends, we could say right now, the reason we don't have the persecution that the early church had, because if you go back in your minds, it was on the day of Pentecost. But before the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they were up in the upper room in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 14, where they were praying together. Amen. They were claiming the promises of God. They were seeking God with all their heart. Do I have a sin? And Paul was, not Paul, but John was saying, hey, I'm sorry, Peter, because I offended you. And hey, I'm, a, I'm very, very sorry for what I did. I sinned against you in this matter. They were confessing their faults yeah. one to another. Yeah. Unity, dear friends. Yes. Coming together. Encouraging the brethren. Yes. Don't beat each other down. Oh. We're all on the same team. Oh, yeah. We're going and so we need to be united and pressed together as those early disciples. And they pressed together and they received power from on high. Amen. They were bold because before they were saying, I can't say that because you know if we say this, this will happen. Or I can't study with that person because I don't know what to say. But when the Spirit of God came upon them, they could not keep their mouth shut. They could not say it. They could not say any longer. It's the job of the pastor. They knew they were called to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so these men and women 
that were there in the early church turn the world upside down. Yes. Turn it upside down. Are you tired of this world? Yes. Or maybe you're thinking, if I can just live for 50 more years, and you have a wish list, and I could get married if you're a young person or older person, and I could have this house and drive this car and have these degrees behind my name, then Jesus can come. But there's seven billion people on this planet, and the largest purport, the largest percentage, the largest um, regions around the world, the most populous regions around the world, do not know Jesus. And you and I in this vineyard, we can be pleading for God to deliver those people who are captive or have captive by ISIS. That is what God is calling us to be. There are brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted. We can have prayer vigil all night and fast and pray. And just like they were praying for Peter, we can pray for these souls. You have young people in this, this part of the vineyard that are on drugs, that are addicted to whatever pornography. We can pray and ask God, just like Paul and Silas prayed, and the, the gates were open. The doors were open in that prison gate. It is through the power of God working through us. Prayer. Claiming the promises of God. Being persistent. My final point is prevailing power. Prevailing power. Prevailing power. Our prevailing power comes only through Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul says it this, in a few words, thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Amen. The victory when by God's grace we're standing on the sea of glass, when by God's grace, when Jesus descended from heaven with a shout, when by God's grace, when the dead in, in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive are caught up, it, together, meeting in the air, Amen. it is only yes. by what Jesus accomplished at Calvary that yes. made it possible. Amen. Where there is boasting, there's no boasting. We're saved through faith. Yes. Saved by grace through faith in what our Savior did. Amen. Dear friends, we should make our calling an election sure. Yes. I picture this loving God, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I picture this loving God with angels. You are not seeing them, but they're there because the Bible tells me in Hebrew, they're ministering spirits who minister unto us day and night for those who will inherit the kingdom. While you are sleeping there by your bed, beat back those demonic powers, those demons that you introduced into your life by the things you watched, those demons that are around you constantly and they're tripping you up all around by the things you and God in His mercy is fighting on our behalf. Amen. Because we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Says the time of trouble, such as never was, is soon to open upon us. And we shall need an experience which we do not now possess. And which many are too indolent to obtain. They're asleep. We are asleep. Here's what it says now in Great Controversy. It is often that the case, the case of trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. Have you ever wondered what this world would be like without God intercepting demonic forces that are about to destroy you and your children? Have you ever wondered what it would be like with the countries that God is keeping in check right now with nuclear and all these powers and, and he is keeping it in check? They're not in control. God is in control. You may think this powerful nation is in control. Man, have no control. God is in control as we heard in our seventh school. Yes. Amen. 
Have you wondered what it would be like when perverted men and women do evil things, but even though we see it on the news, it's still kept in check. Because the Bible tells us in Revelation that God has given the decree to the angels, hurt not the earth. And so they're guarding, there's a little wind coming through, a little strife coming through. They're a little bit until he seals his people in their forehead. God is giving you and I this opportunity on this very day to make our calling and election sure. Young people, maybe you're busy talking right now. But what will you do when the prince of this world says, I want her because she's mine. The prince of this world is Satan. God is contended with him that contend with thee. But there's coming a time, the Bible tells us, when we will have no intercessor. No. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf, day and night, giving orders to all the angels around the world, saying, go here, do this, do that, do this. But there will come a time when the Bible says, he that is unjust, let it be unjust. He that is filthy, let it be filthy still. He that is righteous, let it be righteous still. He that is holy, let it be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. Yes. But in that time, when Jesus stands up from his position, changes his garments and no longer has on those priestly robes, because the priest would be there doing, and that one time of the year, the Day of Atonement, to atone for the sins of his people. And in this time when Jesus takes those priestly robes off and he stands up, there will be a time of trouble such as never was. Daniel says, how will you stand in that great day? It is not a message of fear. It is a message of urgency. If Daniel were standing here today, he would not say this in a tame way. If John the Revelator were standing here, he would not say it in a tame way because he knew the powers of darkness are marshalling all their forces to this last great war, the Battle of Armageddon, the greatest battle. And in Daniel chapter 12, the Bible tells us at that time, Michael, Jesus Christ himself, shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. You see what he's doing? He's standing watch. He's on our side. If God be for us, who can be against us? And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. You read about ISIS, he says that pales to nothing. This time of trouble will make that eclipse to nothing. Amen. It is serious. Yes. And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. So you can read through Genesis to Revelation, you can never find a time like that. You read in the books of Genesis and all the various things that happen. I'm reading through the Bible here again and over and over I says, wow, there are so many wars and destruction and death, 70,000 years, this and all. It amounts to nothing compared to this challenging time. And I was talking with my wife. And the thought came to me as we were talking that we're not prepared for this time. Our prayer life does not reflect preparation for this time. We don't know the promises of God for this time. We're not as persistent in our prayer for this time. We sure enough cannot prevail because we're not going through what God has called us to do. Our young people are spiritually illiterate, not knowing the word of God. They know 
more about who the rap artist and who this other person is and what they live and where they live and how many cars they have. But dear friends, this means nothing in this last battle. It doesn't matter how many songs you have on your iPod. It doesn't matter where you have been or what you have studied. It will be only the protection of the living God that will make it. Amen. 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 The Bible tells us, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Those who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. At that time, you will be delivered. Our scripture reading we read earlier, it says, alas, for that day is great. The Bible doesn't go over the top and exaggerate, by the way, okay? Whatever the Bible says is, is face value and it is God's love. It is Noah saying, get into the ark because there is a flood. It is Elijah saying, why hold between two opinions? If the God be, if the God is your God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. It is that message. It is a decisive message. Amen. And so in Jeremiah chapter 30, another prophet of God says, Alas, speaking of the day that is coming. For that day is great so that none is like it. It sounds like what Daniel said. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Remember Jacob, he was there, left alone. He had sin on his heart and he wrestled with God asking for forgiveness, making it right. And God heard his humble cry. Amen. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it all. As the members of the body of Christ approach the period of their last conflict, the time of Jacob's trouble, they will grow up into Christ and will partake largely of his spirit. It is the latter rain which revives and strengthens them to pass through the time of trouble. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It is not human strength that will make it through. You may say, well, brother, pastor, sister, whoever, I don't have the courage and strength. If you have the courage and strength that God gives you, that's all you need. Amen. The weakest soul who places their life in the hand of God, they will make it through. Amen. It is, where is your shelter? Where is your safety? Is it found under the wings of the Almighty? The Bible says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide you in his pavilion and set you high upon a rock. In times past, God was faithful. You read about what happened to those precious people the Waldensians, they were there in the protection of caves. I've read stories where soldiers walked within close proximity of them and did not see them. I've read in the Bible where there's a man by the name of Elijah the Tishbite who God fed him with ravens. I've read in the Bible where it says your bread and water will be sure. Yeah. I've read in Matthew chapter 10 verse 19, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about what or how you should speak. Yeah. For it shall be given to you in that hour what you should speak. Yeah. So you're probably saying, I don't know this. God says, don't worry. about those things. If God be for us, who could be against us? Shall tribulation or distress or peril or sword or nakedness? Are we afraid of those things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Dear friends, this message is crucial. I want you to be prayerful. Maybe you have been just on the fringes. I praise God you are here. Yes. 
You could have been many places. So just by you being here, the Spirit of God has drawn you. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Older people, pray for our young people. I teach in the academy and I see the challenges they face. The things that they have encountered in their short life. Many of us have never encountered in 40 years of our lives. So they need to be encouraged and pointed in the right direction. Families. Family worship is crucial. We're busy. But how many of you, if you were in the White House or whatever your Prime Minister has here, how many of you would leave without the protection of those Secret Service men and women to protect you? But we do that every day with our children and our husbands and wives without having the protection of God. Church family, the end is near. It is not a time to be about our own business. We should be about our Father's Amen. business. And I echo what Pastor Morris says. It is time for us to go out and let those people around us know about it. It is not good enough just to, for us to be in the ark of safety. Noah preached to the entire world in his time to get in the ark. We should do the same. And I pray that each and every one of us, by his grace, will be in that number. Father in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of each person here. You know each heart. And Lord, as we Bring this to a close. You know those who are struggling with sin. You know those who are busy not having time to pray. You know those who do not know your promises. And then because of that, they cannot pray on behalf of your will. Because it's not known. Lord, you know those who get weary and cannot persist through prayer, through difficulties. I pray, O oh God, you being the God of Israel, the God who prevailed, will give us divine power. Lord, maybe there's someone here today who says, Lord, I desire for your angelic host to protect me and your blood to cover me as we go through these difficult times. And that is your desire, just raise your hand. Father in heaven, you have seen the hands raised. Please, Lord, be our shield and buckler. Be our protection. And we thank you that you've promised that you will not leave us nor forsake us even until the end of the age. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.